what's up y'all welcome back to wto i'm your host will and today we're going back to the very beginning to the origins of the most successful virtual music group in all history gorillas but before we get to that i got some exciting news for you guys as you guys know this channel started out as a passion project for myself where i would make lyric videos animation super grateful for the support you guys have given to me over the years with those but lately i've been feeling like i want to do something more that's why in 2024 wto the channel will be moving towards more long forms of content such as this video you're watching right now but don't worry because the visualizers and the lyric videos and all that other stuff it's still going to be on the channel but it's going to be more spaced apart and upload schedule i have a lot of ideas and plans for this vision so can't wait to share them with you and you guys better stay tuned get ready for a wild ride let's get to the topic of the video the early beginnings of gorillas also known as phase one this is a period that often gets overlooked in the fandom but it's crucial to understanding how gorillas came to be and what they stood for to do that we have to go back to the late 90s a time when the music industry was dominated by bland and boring pop acts like bash street boys britney spears and all of the sorts. These were the kinds of artists that you would constantly hear on MTV, which is the main source of music and entertainment for many people at the time. But not everyone was happy with the status quo. Two people in particular who were fed up with the lack of creativity and originality in the music scene. These were Damon Albarn and Jamie Hewlett, two British artists who achieved fame and success in their own fields respectively. But they were also facing some personal and professional challenges. Damon Albarn was the frontman of Blur, one of the most popular Britpop bands of the 90s, but he had just broken up with his longtime girlfriend, Justine Frenchman, who was the lead singer of another Britpop act, Elastica, which I, I have never listened to them. Jamie Hewlett was the co-creator of Tank Girl, which was a cult comic book series that had been adapted into a Hollywood movie, but the movie flopped at the box office and had lost control of his own creation. Due to Hollywood. The two of them ended up living together in a flat in the Trellick Tower, a brutalist building in West London in 1998. As they were living together, they started to bond over their shared frustration with the music industry and their desire to do something different, something that would change the shallow and superficial music that was being promoted. And they felt like there was a gap in the market for something more innovative and meaningful. They decided to create their own band, but not just any band band that would be completely animated, with fictional characters and a fictional backstory. A band that would mix different genres and styles, from rock and hip-hop to reggae and electronica. A band that would have a strong visual identity with a comic book aesthetic and a dark sense of humor. And a band would be called Gorillas. What's going on is, is you guys have a gorilla show. You're doing a few shows here in the U.S., right? Doing five and, nights at the Apollo in Harlem. Okay. So how'd you guys... This is one of the more like brilliant, off the wall, amazing music concepts that's you know come up in a long time. Right. What were you guys doing, sitting around, and all of a sudden like, cartoon band? We're <clears throat> gonna make a cartoon band. See, I'm the sort of person who watches TV and just screams at it all night long. And then I ended up watching TV with him, and he's kind of the same. So we just we were watching MTV, and we we're just like, what's all this rubbish? <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> we saw this rubbish manufactured crap. So yeah. we thought we could probably do it a little bit better, but slightly different. People take themselves way too seriously in yeah. the music business, so I suppose Gorillaz for us is just a sort of, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an antidote to that. This was the beginning of a two-year journey of development during which Gorillaz took shape, transforming from a mere idea to a revolutionary musical project. Damien Jamie worked hard to create music and visuals for their band, collaborating with various musicians and animators along the way. They traveled over to Jamaica, where they recorded in their studio at G-Jam, they scheduled a luxurious resort that had previous hosted artists like York, No Doubt, and Amy Winehouse. They also worked with Passion Pictures, a London-based animation studio that produced award-winning commercials and short films. Together, they brought life to the four animated members of Gorillaz. Murdoch, the self-proclaimed leader and bassist who is a satanic and egotistical jerk. Tootie, the lead vocalist and keyboard, who was a sweet, naive zombie with black eyes. Russell, the drummer percussionist, who was a hip-hop loving and spiritually possessed giant. Noodle, who was the guitarist and occasional singer, who was mysterious and just showed up to their house one day. With the help of their quirky and colorful avatars, Damien and Jamie were ready to bring gorillas into the world. 
Their debut EP, Tomorrow Comes Today, released in November of 2000. It was the first taste of their musical style, which blended elements of trip-hop, dub, and alternative rock. It also featured the song Clint Eastwood, which would become their first hit single and their signature track. The song featured vocals from Dell the Funky Homo Sapien, who appeared as a ghostly rapper that possessed Russell. The song was accompanied with a great music video which was directed by Jamie, where it showed the band performing in a haunted graveyard surrounded by dancing zombies. The video was a sensation and put Gorillaz really on the map, especially on the internet, as a band that was unlike anything else in the music scene. But this was just the beginning. They released their self-titled debut album in March in 2001 which featured 15 tracks that showcased their experimental sound, as well as their collaboration with various artists. The album was a critical and commercial success, selling over 7 million copies worldwide and earning them a nomination in the Mercury Prize, a prestigious award for the best British album of the year. They also released three more singles for their album to promote it. 192000, which showed the band driving in a Jeep on a highway, encountering various obstacles and enemies, such as the moose, Rock the House, which showed the band performing in a haunted house while being attacked by flying objects and a giant moose. Tomorrow Comes Today, which shows the band in their studio playing with various gadgets and instruments. The previous years from 1998 to 2000 saw Damon Auburn's relentless efforts to create Gorilla's self-titled debut album, along with many other collaborators. The recording sessions took place at Albarn's newly opened Studio 13 in London and G-Jam Studios in Jamaica, setting the stage for the birth of the virtual band. If you want to get a glimpse into the creative process behind the scenes, you can check out their documentary titled Banana, which released way back in Phase 2. You can find some poor quality re-uploads online, but they still capture the atmosphere and personalities of the real people behind the project. I won't go too much into detail here, but I highly recommend y'all to go check it out. It is well worth the watch. You can also find some demos and other cool artifacts from these recording days online. Really interesting to explore as a fan of Gorillaz for over a decade. During this creative process, Damon Albarn's musical exploration went beyond the confines of his previous work with Blur. Most people know Gorillaz for their ability to effortlessly merge genres together. Del the Funky Hope of Sampian and DJ Kid Koala, both associated with Nakamura, contributed their talents to the project. The device range of artists that were featured on the album showed Gorilla's collective efforts that would define the project in years to come. The album sold over 7 million copies worldwide, all fueled by the breakout single Clint Eastwood. Now a lot of people were purchasing the album expecting a whole album full of Clint Eastwood type of tracks, but it was evident that this wasn't really what Albarn envisioned. The album's promotion included a series of singles, each accompanied by a music video directed by Jamie Hewlett, the visual genius behind Gorilla's animated persona. Hewlett's creative touch extended beyond videos. He and his team of zombie flesh eaters also designed the band's interactive website, presenting it as an immersive tour of the fictional Kong Studios. The website featured interactive games and explorative elements, providing fans with a unique and engaging experience. Following the album's release, Gorillaz embarked on a brief but memorable tour of Europe, Japan, and the United States. The live performances featured a unique setup, where the touring band, led by Albarn, played it obscured behind this giant screen projecting Hewlett's visuals. The virtual band members' voice actors were even present at some shows, adding an extra layer of the immersion. Additional content like visualizers and stage designs would take a more prominent role in the years to come, and even spawn many communities in the fandom replicate these elements, as they are usually not posted publicly. After the release of their debut album in 2001, Gorillaz didn't rest on their laurels. Instead, they continued their global expansion, cementing their place as not only a musical act, but as a multimedia phenomenon. However, the global reach of Gorillaz expanded beyond the musical realm. As the success of their debut album reverberated, Albarn and Hewlett briefly explored the ambitious idea of the Gorillaz theatrical film. However, their encounter with Hollywood executives led to a temporary loss of interest. Despite this setback, their determination to maintain creative control foreshadowed the independent spirit that would define Gorillaz in the years to come. The duo decided to shelve the film idea, vowing to revisit it when a time was right and they could do it on their own terms. Although it's very obvious that Gorillaz has made merch and sell shirts, we see everyone wearing it all the time, the band embraced on the rising popularity of the mobile phone. Yes, mobile phones 
and not the iPhone, I'm talking about the Nokia phone cases which featured their iconic visuals. This move not only capitalized on the market for music-related merchandise, but it also ensured that fans could carry a piece of Gorillaz with them in their daily lives. The enduring impact of Gorillaz's Phase 1 is evident in the year of 2021, which marked the 20th anniversary of their own debut. To celebrate this milestone, the band released a compilation that not only paid homage to the groundbreaking music, but also served as a testament to the lasting impact of their animated revolution. As we reflect on Gorillaz's transformation from the television to merchandise, their innovative approach to storytelling and branching becomes increasingly evident. The animated revolution they pioneered during this period not only solidified their place in music history, but it also set the stage for the evolution of multimedia engagement in the years to come. Join us as we venture deeper into the layers of Gorillaz's legacy, exploring how they continue to redefine the boundaries of music and animation. I'm Will, and thank you all for tuning in. Stay tuned for episode 2 coming next week.